everyone. So I'm going to take a break from talking about the tools of AI and instead talk a little bit about how to manage an AI process or an AI development project, right? Um, and to do that, we're going to use something called ChrisDM. And uh, ChrisDM was, is, the, is the cross-industry standard protocol for data mining. It was created in 1996 by a consortium of different industries, among them Teradata, Daimler, um, NCR, um, uh, uh, and others, right? It's widely used still by IBM to this day, right? Um, and, you know, that data mining term seems like it might be a bit archaic, uh, but it's, it's essentially a term that was used to describe a variety of machine learning and some non-machine learning techniques that were really used to dig into mine data, right, in many ways. Um, and so nowadays, it's very useful for understanding machine learning type processes. And my students and I uh, were asked to write a paper for um, uh, the Journal of California Management Review about the use of artificial intelligence. And we decided to focus on this managing process, right, um, aspect of it. And we thought, we thought about trying to come up with a new process to describe how we go about um, the uh, AI development process. But... We, it's the more and more we read, the more and more we realized that Chris DM kind of covered a lot of the same topics. So we'd essentially be reinventing a lot of Chris DM. Um, and it's nice because it's been used in a wide variety of contexts from, you know, um, AI in cars to um, developing business processes and automating them better to um, looking at image analysis, for instance. Um, and so it's very appropriate for the development of an AI application. Um, ChrisDM is set up as a series of steps, and these steps kind of form a cycle that should be never ending, right? In step one, you go through business understanding, uh, you determine the business objective, determine the AI goals, produce a project plan, and IBM's made available a whole set of questions that they use for these kind of things. And then step two, you do data understanding. You collect the initial data, describe the data, create a data dictionary, which is a, a document that describes the data, um, explore, visualize, and verify the data. It's kind of similar to the way I've been trying to teach you how to do AI in many places, right? Then step three is data preparation, select and clean the data, construct new data. You might have to integrate, you might have to get it from different formats into the same place. You might have to take unstructured data and make it structured so it's usable. And then step four is modeling, right? Identify the AI method that you're gonna to use to explore the data, generate some testing criteria, and then build and assess the model. Step five is evaluation. Now, evaluation is not what you might think at first. You might think, well, didn't we just do that in the modeling step? But evaluation is how well does this new model that we've now created actually solve the business problem, right? Evaluate the results, review the process, and then determine the next steps. And then step six, most importantly, deployment. How are we actually going to make this work? How are we going to put it out into uh, our normal industry landscape and make it so it's a viable tool? Um, and then you report and review. So this is the nice summary diagram that of, of how the ChrisDM process works. You start with business understanding, go to data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, deployment. Now, you might have to go back and forth several times here, right? So as you develop a better business understanding, you might change what data you might need to take a look at. So you might go back to the business understanding because it turns out some of the data you are thinking you could use, you couldn't use. So now you have to go back to business understanding and understand. Once you have that data, you can then go to preparation, right? And for preparation, you go to modeling, but sometimes when you're building a modeling, you realize, oh, we really need to prepare that data in different formats, so you might head back. Then evaluate, and of course, in evaluation, as I mentioned, you're really comparing against the original business problem, so you may have to even go all the way back, reevaluate the business understanding, and complete the cycle again, right? This should be a never-ending cycle to a large extent. You should always be trying, if you're working in the space of AI and analytics for business applications, right? You should be constantly trying to improve your processes. I'm gonna take one particular example that we kind of developed in our lab for a paper we were working on, where we were trying to decide, we're trying to build a tool for a company to help them decide whom to respond to on Twitter. And I'm gonna go, and this is the summary diagram, but I'm gonna go through each of the different uh, stages in detail. So the business understanding, right? The big, big question that we had 
Uh, and this actually was motivated directly by a situation that I was involved in where I flew into San Francisco airport and I was stuck in this huge line trying to get a rental car. I was supposed to give a talk. I think it was at LinkedIn. I can't remember um, later that afternoon and I couldn't get a rental car and I was very frustrated. So I tweeted a picture of the fact that I was standing in this huge line uh, to national uh, car rental. Right. And um you know, National Car Rental, their Emerald Dial policy is really nice normally, right? You walk up, pick up a car, and you just drive away. And I was waiting for like an hour. Um, and so I tweeted at them, and they responded fairly quickly, right? Like they responded shortly after I tweeted. I was actually, I don't think I'd even gotten in the car yet, and they tweeted back at me. Um, and, you know, we had this little bit of negotiation. They wound up sending me an email, and eventually they wound up giving me a free day rental out of that. But the question came to me as this was happening why did they respond to me, right? Who should they respond to? And from National's perspective, right, how should they decide who they should be responding to? And so I wanted to better understand that very question. So I started thinking about what kind of data could they collect about me, you know, if I wasn't connected, if they didn't know that that was me particularly, how could they collect data quickly? So they could collect tweets and profile information about me, right? So they could get that data, they could look at it, and they could try and make a decision based upon my Twitter presence, whether or not I'm someone they should offer to. And by the way, let's point out that there might be reasons why they don't want to, right? Like maybe I'm someone who just complains all the time and I never purchase from National, right? I normally purchase from Avis. So why would they even bother to provide some sort of customer fix to me in this solution? So they need to figure out how to prioritize this. And part of that kind of dilemma was influenced by a paper that a, a colleague of mine at uh, University of Maryland wrote, uh, Lee Ma, where he talked about how um, a lot of times when people complain on Twitter or social media, they they get redressed and they feel better about the company, but they're more likely to complain again. So can we prevent that process from happening? Right. So we had to prepare this data, right? So what we decided to do was like, maybe look at like the time series of how people were tweeting over time and figure out if there's some sort of behavior of people who are constant complainers versus those people who aren't that we can kind of analyze in that data series and then place me in a category of someone who's likely to talk about the company again in the future or someone who's just going to tweet at me once and never talk about the company ever again, right? Um, and so we did some modeling. We did some user classification to try and figure out exactly where they should be. Uh, we actually used something called, uh, we'll use a couple of techniques, one called causal state modeling, one called finite data analysis um, uh, to kind of functional data analysis to kind of look to see if there were patterns in users who are likely to talk about the company again versus those who weren't. Uh, this involved us going back and forth. We had to think about like, oh, do we need more concrete data? Do we need more descriptions, right? Um, and so we had to go back to steps two and three several times. And then we evaluated the data by kind of tr splitting into this five, six training data and one, six testing data and kind of exploring um, whether or not we were able to classify users who we didn't know, right? And we use classification accuracy as our evaluation. Now, in reality, we did this as kind of a hypothetical situation, so it wasn't actually deployed. Uh, but you can imagine that this could eventually be deployed and you could see a little toolkit on um, the customer service managers for national car rental that whenever someone tweets at them, it gives them a probability of how likely that person is to complain about the company in the future, how likely they are to do business with the company in the future, how you know, how high a customer lifetime value that innovation might have. And that would give them a better idea of how to, what um, uh, offers they can make to the individual to assuage their concerns, right? Um, so that's an example of Chris DM. And before I end, I want to just talk about the fact that, you know, as we develop these kind of, this process, one thing we discovered over many examples of applying Chris DM to these AI systems is that you really need to involve stakeholders early on. There's a lot of times there's questions and problems that come about that can only be involved by them giving you insights into the business of what's going on, the business problem at hand. Um, do not be afraid to cycle from data to model and back again. I, a lot of people um, you know, often are like, no, 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 we got a model that's up and running, let's just keep working with it. But in reality, uh, you know, there's a, there's a line uh, about writing that says kill your darlings and the same thing applies to kill your models, right? Kill your darlings, kill the models that are doing well if they're not 
if they don't solve the problem that you have, go back and try other models, right? Um, think carefully about transforming the data, right? Like different forms of the data are gonna have different effects on your overall modeling process, and that's important. Uh, make sure you match your evaluation criteria to the business problem at hand, right? Um, let's say that, you know, in the national car case that we were talking about, right, you built this perfect tool, it's working great, it's doing awesome, but it doesn't really give you the insight you need to determine whether or not to make this simple offer, right, to the person, the one day offer. Who cares if it tells me a whole bunch of other stuff about the individual, if it doesn't give me the information I need to decide whether or not I should make a one day uh, free rental offer to that person, it's not useful. Um, and again, you know, finally, the whole process should be cycled, never ending. You should be constantly revising and updating your processes. So that's a brief summary of the CRISPR-DM process. There's some articles up on Moodle that will help you with that. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks.